Hey, uh, welcome to another edition of This Week in Triathlon. Today is Thursday. It is July 18th, uh, 2013. And I'm alongside Kevin Tedonio, your co-host in Folsom, California. My name is Andres Duzoglu. That's how you pronounce it, Kevin. Duzoglu. Um, not that hard, right? Um, you always on me. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, anyway, we've got a lot to talk about today. Actually, uh, both of us raced last weekend. Uh, in case you haven't joined us before, uh, this week in triathlon is about a lot of different things. We like to talk about the races uh, from the past weekend. We like to precap what's coming up the weekend ahead of us and definitely talk about the technology and gossip in the triathlon world. So uh, without further ado, uh, how are you doing, Kevin? Well, sp speaking of gossip, uh, I'm, I'm not doing too good, to be honest. Uh, just to let our, our viewers know, we have a little bit of a bet going, uh, you and I. Um, we're, we're both trying to lose weight for our big races of the year. You're racing uh, 70.3 uh, uh, World Championships in Vegas. Congratulations for getting your slot last week in Vine Man. And uh, I'm racing uh, Tahoe on September 22nd. We're both trying to lose some weight, so we thought, hey, let's have a little uh, friendly bet. So we weighed in, took a picture of the scale. We've been uh, going back and forth. So I'm not feeling too good because <laughs> I haven't been eating too much. So if I pass out... Just call my wife and let her know I'm on the floor. <laughs> I will. Uh, I will call Christy. Um, and uh, but hopefully we won't get to that. Yes, and and you're 100% correct. We've got a little bit of a. You know, just to update people that may not know the history of, of our little bets. At this point, I owe you. I think two beers. And if this doesn't go my way, I'm going to owe you four beers. Uh, we've, we've made it essentially a double or nothing. So before we know it, I might just have to buy you a whole keg. But yeah, my, 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 pl my plan is to you know, at least get a keg or at least a, you know, a, half a, you know, a quarter barrel by the time we hit Kona. And, and I want to have a big party on Elite You Drive with my keg and my, my little red Solo cup. <laughs> Well, the the cool thing about that is uh, I'll be there, so I'll get to enjoy it too. So uh, I may not such a, be such a bad thing, but uh, I, I guess we can call it the uh, um, <laughs> whatever that TV show, <laughs> Biggest Loser Twit Edition, maybe. <laughs> All right. Well, well, uh, just uh, we'll, we'll I think we'll we'll check in with our our, our, our viewers next week. Let us know how we're how we're doing and how we're we're hopefully wasting away uh, at a slow enough pace. We're not quite losing power and strength, but. Uh, I, we definitely got to lose a little a couple pounds, especially me after my uh, result uh, at Vineman. I, I know I need to get uh, down to race shape. So, but uh, yeah, and, and before we before we get into uh, into the, the the races from this past weekend, uh, obviously we have to invite everybody to join us on on Facebook. Um, this week in triathlon is on Facebook. If you go to facebook.com uh, slash this week in triathlon, you can also um, email us at uh, this week and try at gmail.com. But uh, yeah, so some, some exciting uh, stuff going on over the weekend. Um, I don't know how you feel about uh, your race. Obviously, uh, like you said, I'm, I'm fairly satisfied with mine, but why don't we talk about Vineman for a little bit? Absolutely. Well, um, you know, what a, a cool venue uh, for a race. Um, out in uh, kind of northwestern California, not too far from the Pacific Ocean, but you know a couple uh, hills over. Uh, the race starts in uh, Guerneville. Uh, for our race, our, 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 our fans that are not familiar with the course, we start. You start actually about 15 miles west of where you actually finish. So there's separate transition zones, uh, which was actually a little bit of a pain. Um, but you know, fortunately, you didn't have to just put your bike out there the night before. Uh, but I did check out the, the swim course the day before, and I'm glad I did because the swim course was quite shallow. Uh, there was a, a good 200 meters of the swim where you can actually get out and dolphin dive, and a lot of pros were dolphin diving. Uh, definitely went anaerobic in the swim. Um, the, 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 the swim packs kind of blew apart pretty quickly with guys like Devin Doherty and uh, others just kind of splitting up the field pretty quickly. Uh, John Dahls led out of the swim. John Dahls is a San Francisco uh, resident. And uh, you know he's a swim specialist, and uh, despite you know a pretty tame uh, swim course, managed to put a little bit of uh, daylight between him and the rest of the field. So um, there was a group of uh, five or six guys that got away in the early part of the bike, and uh, just from my, um, I, I was basically on my own. But uh, it, the the bike course was was really kind of a cool 
um, technical kind of route through, through the vineyards. It was, it was a really nice course. Um, the only complaint I had was I wish there was more spectator support. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I thought it was a little bit quiet out there in the vineyards. And uh, even going through some of the towns, it didn't seem like there was anybody really out there. What do you think about that? Yeah, there's definitely, I mean, I was preoccupied. I was the second to last wave, so I was preoccupied with uh, navigating in and out of, of the course traffic, um, both spectators and, and some of the congestion on course with uh, some of the cars trying to make their way, as you said, back to the, to the, to the run area where the, the race finishes. But uh, so I didn't really have much time to think about spectators. But uh, yeah, it, it. I think the 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 nice thing about the venue is, as you mentioned, there's. It's a beautiful course throughout a lot of the vineyards that a lot of people have heard about, uh, whether they're in California or not. So I, I think that itself makes it a lot easier to um, to deal with. Uh, you know, it didn't bother me too much. Uh, I'm looking at some of the pictures on triathlete.com, uh, and and yeah, it did seem a little bit quiet for the pros. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I can see it both ways. But like I said, I, I don't think I I had time to pay attention to who was watching and who wasn't because there was quite a bit of quite a few people out on the course, and um, I had to rely on some of my. Uh, crit racing expertise in, in a few instances. I was happy that uh, that I ride in a pack quite a bit just because, uh, yeah, it got a little dangerous. And uh, I was actually surprised. I, I know that the beginning part of the bike course was a little bit technical, a little bit of rough roads, nothing nothing horrible. I'm still glad I had a 25 mil uh, tire on the back. Uh, there are definitely a couple of rough sections, but it, it wasn't really necessarily rough road. It just seemed like there were ripples in the concrete that if you weren't paying attention, you could really eat it if you weren't... Uh, you know, looking up the road. Yeah, and and you know, we, we had a little bit of a, a back and forth before the uh, before the race last weekend in terms of uh, the pavement. For for me, it, it it seemed like it wasn't so bad, but you're obviously used to a lot more smooth roads, and and for you, it was probably a lot worse than it than it was for me. I mean, I guess it's all relative, but um, but yeah, I, I mean, I I guess the ultimate. Uh, sign that the the roads were not the best is how many bottles I saw on the road. It was just insane. I mean, you wouldn't go more than three minutes without seeing a bunch of bottles on the road. So that to me shows me that the that the roads aren't necessarily the best. But here's a little bit of a try gossip for you. Um, in in our pro meeting, there's a new rule that if there's a, there's a difference now between littering and actually intentional littering. So if a bottle flies off your bike. It's a, it's a yellow card violation, which means that if you get another one, you can be penalized. Um, but if it's intentional littering, where if you take a bottle and you're not in a feed zone and you just throw it into a vineyard or into a field or off the road, um, it's actually now a red card, so it's a four-minute penalty now. And um, I have to admit, uh, I actually, uh, at the beginning of the bike course, I, I, I actually, uh, I, I'm sad to say I had to intentionally litter because it was so foggy and so humid that my visor instantly fogged up. And in the first two miles, I had to rip that sucker off. I held on to it. And I was looking for some place to toss it. I even considered just stuffing it down my jersey. Um, but I just, you know, I looked around. I didn't see any motorcycles, and I just tossed it into someone's driveway. I, I definitely got it off the road. But had I been seen by a referee, I would have got a four-minute penalty. So no more visor for you, huh? Uh, no more visor. So I'll try not to do that with your uh, cast bambino when I borrow it for uh, Ironman Tahoe. <laughs> Yeah, you know those uh, those visors are, are pretty pretty hard to come by. Um, <laughs> you know, I that's um, I, I considered speaking of visors, I considered uh, using it for for the race, but you know, I, I just don't think it's it's worth it. Um, I think the comfort and and just avoiding that situation alone is is worth the extra five seconds that I, that I'm tacking on to to the bike portion of it. So. Um, but uh, I guess it is what it is. But uh, y y let's talk a, a little bit about how the pro race shaped up. Obviously, uh, you were in the thick of things. Uh, it, when I was looking at the results, even though you said you were by yourself, it seemed like you and, and Matt Russell came out of the water at around the same time. So I'm curious to see if, if at least you guys had an opportunity to work together a little bit. 
Well, um, being in the thick of the race, uh, I unfortunately was uh, in the thick of the women's race for a little bit of the swim. Uh, when Meredith Kessler uh, and Emily Cox blew by me in their Roka wetsuits, um, I tried to hang on their feet, but they just cruised right by me, uh, right as you pass those bridges uh, just towards the finish. Uh, I was right with Matt Russell um, just before the bridges, uh, just before the finish, about two, three hundred yards. Um, but I actually had a little bit of an issue uh, just sighting. Uh, I didn't hug the inside line. I actually lost about 30 seconds or so. Uh, going into T2, I had a really terrible transition. I had a hard time getting into my shoes on that uphill, that steep uphill. Um, so you come out of T1 and you have a steep uphill. I had my shoes on the bike and uh, I wasn't able to clip in. Uh, I had to stop and almost consider just jumping off and just running my bike up that hill because I, I really had a difficult time. It was kind of embarrassing. And uh, by the time I got to the top of the hill, Matt Russell was gone. Um, I, you know, I quickly saw Meredith Kessler. She looked strong on her Cannondale. Emily Cox looked like she had about a you know about a thirty second gap behind her, and um, you know the men's race. Uh, Bevan Dockery, from what I understand, uh, you know just put in a hard acceleration about in the early stages of the bike and came off the bike with a two and a half minute lead going into T two. Wrote a two oh six, which is pretty impressive. I, I wrote a two sixteen, so he put ten minutes into me. I averaged three hundred and eleven watts. I wonder what kind of power this guy is putting out on the bike. Yeah, he's he's somebody who's I mean he's he's made a mark on this and in the seventy point three and and actually he's done quite well in the Ironman distance as well. He's already has a win, but he can bike and he can that guy can do it all. I mean he's just uh, he's pretty amazing. And the more I see him race and the more I see his his results, the more impressed I am by it. But on that course, a two hundred six is ridiculously fast. It really is, and it just goes to show that you know there's 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 a reason he's one of the the the, the contenders. Uh, the, there are people shortlist for a win at Kona, and uh, not to not to discount guys like Terenzo Bazzoni and Tim Reed and uh, Joe Gambles. Those guys all have great races. Tim Reed uh, finished in second, uh, just edging uh, Terenzo Bazzoni there. Uh, I thought it was going to be a little bit tighter there, but um, I was surprised to see uh, Craig Alexander kind of stepping away. Um, from the, the start line uh, just before that race. I, I know that he had some support that was there specifically for him. Um, so when he pulled out, it must have been a pretty abrupt pullout. Maybe he wasn't feeling 100%. Maybe he just, uh, just changed his mind about racing. Yeah, sometimes things come up, and I think that was the case uh, with Craig this weekend. Uh, he did have uh, folks from, from Shimano up at, uh, at, at Vineman. So it was a last-minute decision. Uh, in, in talking with Ryan, he did say that Andy Potts uh, knew he wasn't racing with a few days in advance. But, yeah, Craig Alexander was just kind of like a last-minute thing. His coach was, was even there. Uh, he was in my age group. I think he took second in the age group. Um, Matt Steinmetz, who used to be uh, one of the guys from, from Retool and now is, I think, his coaching company is called it's a coaching and consulting company, but I think it's called 51 Speed Shop, which I'm not quite sure what the, what the name references. But he was there, so I, I, I think, yeah, I think that it was uh, definitely a last-minute thing. Yeah, and, you know, I was thinking, the more I thought about it, I, I was thinking, you know, the Ironman race, especially in Hawaii, is such a mental game uh, amongst, amongst these guys. He probably saw the start list. He probably has his eyes totally on the prize at Kona, maybe 70.3 Worlds as well. And probably just thought, you know, is it really worth it to, to really beat myself up, try to run a 110 mar half marathon that could be with Bevan Doherty, maybe get beat, and then maybe losing that mental edge going into 70.3 worlds uh, when it's hotter, uh, when, when Croy kind of has that experience in the edge and the heat. Um, so, I, I, you know, I don't blame him for kind of stepping away and taking a pass. Yeah, and, and maybe that was the reason, maybe it wasn't. I mean, it, that's part of what we do in the show is we speculate, which is uh, kind of fun sometimes. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, his performance last year at the World Championships uh, w wasn't probably what he was expecting. Not probably what anybody was expecting. And uh, he's probably trying to redeem himself this year. He did get second place at the seventy point three Worlds, which is pretty decent, especially behind Sebastian Kinley, who had a, a pretty decent race. So I mean, who knows? Uh, like I said, it's just uh, you know, we we. We're not going to be shy about speculating, and that certainly uh, makes sense if that's the reason. Well, speaking of speculating, I actually feel bad because uh, Heather Jackson, um, I saw her at the turnaround. I saw, I, I saw Meredith and Heather Jackson kind of, I was coming out of, I was coming past La Crema heading back to the finish line when they were kind of going out for that out and back. 
Um, and they were a few miles behind me. But I, I saw Heather Jackson, the way she was running, I thought she, for sure she was going to catch, uh, catch on Meredith Kessler, especially the way that uh, she runs and the way she looked. So I, I yelled to Heather Jackson, you know, you keep running like you're, gonna, like you're running, you're going to catch her. And, uh, you know, she never did. Meredith Kessler held her off all the way to the finish. I think Heather Jackson might have blown up there a little bit towards the end. Uh, but Meredith Kessler coming off a bad crash uh, just a couple weeks ago, being in the hospital, um, you know, is you know, really established herself, uh, at least at the cooler races, you know, as one of the best racers in the world. Yeah, and uh, I'm trying to pull up uh, here a, a, a picture of – Miss Heather Jackson from the uh, the race over the weekend. I don't know if uh, you can see it up on the screen. Yeah, I, I can see it. That was uh, just uh, about where I saw her, kind of heading towards the La Crema Winery. Yeah, so um, you know, it uh, she's she's somebody who who typically makes her move um, on the run, and I mean Meredith Kessler is not a slow a slow runner. Um, here's a picture of of her. Uh, on the run as well, and and um, these are courtesy of of Susan, my my wife. She stopped in a in a couple of places and and was able to grab a couple of of good shots. But um, pretty impressed with with Meredith, and and like you said, I mean, it's been about a month since her her crash where she broke her some ribs or had a concussion. I mean, it was it was fairly serious. So for her to to be back and and win uh, fairly convincing convincingly was was pretty remarkable so and she's such a nice I mean she's awesome so you you can't you know you can't but feel ha feel super happy for her and and uh, um, speaking of pictures uh, there is a picture of uh, you somewhere in there but uh, I'll, I'll pull it up and and show it to you <laughs> in a bit yeah, here, here's Bevan Doherty guy heading back towards the finish this is at about mile nine uh, heading towards the finish and uh, Bevan here, uh, he had about two and a half in the lead. I think he was actually able to back off the gas heading in. He knew he had the win. Hey, there's your narrator right there, breaking the tape. They must have thought I was thanks in the for, uh, Thanks for posting those pictures. Uh, I, I know you'll post them on Facebook, uh, on our, our facebook.com slash uh, This Week in Triathlon page uh, once you get them out of uh, Photoshop there. But, uh, but move, moving on from Vineman 70.3, uh, I, I, we got we to gotta obviously touch upon uh, my favorite race in the entire world, uh, triathlon, marathon, cycling race or not, my favorite race uh, that I've ever competed in is Challenge Roth, and uh, I've, I've, I've told you that many times. I've been a big advocate of this, this Challenge race uh, in Roth, Germany, um, ever since I competed in it in 2011. It's a fantastic race, well-run race. It's a community race. People come out in hundreds of thousands to cheer on this race. Um, so, Andre, so are we going to do this race next year or what? I don't know. What, what do they say? Never say never? Yeah, well, well I, I recommend it. Uh, this is one of those special races where um, you know, you're literally going by people's houses. They come out for it. Uh, it's a big event. They look forward to it all year. Um, there's climbs on it like the Solarberg climb. It's a short climb, but it's about a mile long. We have about 100,000 people cheering you on. Uh, I actually dropped a chain on that climb uh, uh, when I did it two years ago. I actually had to get put back on my bike like in the Tour de France and get pushed along. Um, but really a cool race. Um, the men's race, uh, Dirk Bockel kind of took over on the bike section of that, uh, that event. And uh, you know, Dirk Bockel, you know, the former Olympian um, from Luxembourg. And uh, I think he's kind of like an official Team Leopard Trek member. I'm not sure what, what kind of the deal is there. But uh, he, uh, he clearly uh, you know, was kind of the class uh, of that race. And then um, on the women's side, I think we saw a really interesting uh, um, race, a uh, kind of race within a race in, uh, in uh, Yvonne Van Vlorken actually catching – Caroline Stefan on the bike. That doesn't really happen too often. Uh, Yvonne Van Vlorken is not really known for her swimming prowess, uh, but she, I think she was able to kind of minimize her gaps in the fast swim course. You swim in kind of a canal on that course, so it's, it's actually quite quick. It's easy to draft, easy to sight. So um, she caught Caroline Stefan and actually put time into her on the bike, which, which uh, I think might, uh, you know, we might see again here a couple months in October on the Big Island. And um, Yvonne Van Vlorken is just an absolute stud on the bike, and uh, unfortunately couldn't quite hold uh, Caroline off on the on the run, so Caroline came by her. But uh, a great race there. Yeah, I don't know if you've uh, the 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 first time I found out about Yvonne Van Vlorken was uh, she has a video on YouTube uh, where she's trying 
she's known for wearing that just white uh, one piece wetsuit and you know I, I somebody posted it on slow twitch and that that's the that's how I found out about her so um, you're talking about the, the white the white tri suit uh, the, the, the skin fit that she was saying you couldn't see her uh, her breasts in this tri suit when it gets wet even though she goes in the shower on the video too and it was it's kind of a raunchy little video. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised it's uh, it's in on YouTube, but you know, I, I guess when you in, when you're in that kind of a shape, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can do whatever the hell you want, you know. Um, right. But but uh, needless to say, um, yeah, I you know I, I Caroline Stefan is is known for for her bike, uh, for being able to 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 bike. Um, you know, as well or, or better than anybody else. So, um, you know, to put time into her, it's it's certainly, um, you know, that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah, and speaking of uh, powerhouse bikers, um, real quick, we got to touch upon uh, Muncie seventy point three uh, last weekend in, in Indiana. These are we're kind of in some weeks where there's kind of some smaller races like um, uh, Ironman we're seeing Ironman Muncie seventy point threes. And um, so a lot of these races we don't follow too closely, but they're actually having some pretty good fields. Muncie, Andrew Starkwoods came over from uh, the Chicago area, biked an incredibly fast two-hour bike split. That was kind of the highlight of that race, uh, just a freak of nature there. Um, clearly one of the best cyclists in the sport right now. And then uh, up in Minneapolis, there's, there's been some, uh, some, some serious, serious rain in, up in the Midwest, and uh, Minneapolis had a, a huge storm kind of just before the Lifetime Minneapolis Triathlon. The race got delayed six hours. They ended up having to actually cut out most of the course. Uh, Cameron Dye, another great uh, cyclist, was actually able to uh, um, uh, outpace Hunter Kemper on the bike, was able to hold him off on the run with Alicia Kay uh, winning the sh that shortened race. And then uh, the last race I think we need to point out is uh, the Boulder Peak 5150. Um, Lisa Norden, uh, Olympic gold medalist, won that race. But I think the interesting uh, race there was actually T.O., um, I, I find this interesting for one reason, that reason just being that T.O. really seems smart in how he's approaching his build-up to Kona. Uh, he's not doing the big Ironman races right now. Uh, I really feel like he's really on form right now. He destroyed uh, a really, really strong field up there, even on a short event. So um, I think T.O. is going to be the American favorite for Kona. You know, I, I think he, that you're probably right when you say that he's going to be the favorite American for Kona. I, I just I, I don't see him factoring in. Um, in in the top five, I just you know the the more I, I see the 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 Americans and and the the top athletes right now and and who they are, I just I just don't see them competing or at least contending for for a top five spot in in, in Kona. I, you know I, I guess everything can change uh, on race day. There's a lot of variables that that go into it, but there's a lot of strong guys out there. I mean, you talk about guys like Aniko Llanos, who looks like finally this year he might be one of the favorites going into this year. You, you never can count out uh, Sebastian, uh, even Marino with all the troubles he's had. Obviously, Craig Alexander. I mean, there's just a lot of guys, and I think for an American to do well, they just have to be out of control, out of their mind on their best day ever. Uh, which I don't know if T.O. can do it. I, I just don't – Andy Potts, I just don't think – you know, I don't think he's he'll ever get to that level. Um, right. You know, we, we actually saw T.O. beat a strong field at Texas last year that included Lance Armstrong and Sebastian Keenly. So uh, he's done it before, and um, we'll see what he can do in a couple months. Yes. Uh, maybe that will be another um, – depending on how our bet goes, maybe that will be another <laughs> – Another beer bet. All right, I like it. Well, well, you know what? There, there was a surprise this week. Um, you know, I'm not often surprised by the big bike manufacturers. Um, often specialized Trek, uh, Cervelo, they kind of leak things, and you kind of, you know, anticipate when the next, you know, P5 or P6 is coming out because they kind of sneak things out. Um, Trek went ahead and just dropped the bomb on us this week, uh, unveiling their their new. Uh, speed concept, uh, and before we get into that, I just want to remind our viewers, you can always join the conversation uh, on this segment by uh, going to our Facebook page.com slash This Week in Triathlon, uh, and also win some swag, uh, just uh, asking us some comments or things to talk about, but um, the Trek Speed concept, um, 
arguably is one of the, the fastest triathlon. It's, it's definitely the most integrated bike, especially with DI2 setups um, out there. Uh, I know you have this new Cervelo P5-6, uh, which is also quite fast. And I think uh, with the Cervelo kind of coming out with that Trek new that they had to step up the game. I actually asked um, in, in Panama last year, Lance Armstrong was racing. I, I asked one of his handlers that was a Trek employee. I said, you know, so when are you guys coming out with a new speed concept? And he said, oh, the speed concept, it's fast enough. There's no reason to ever improve it. Well, with guys like Cervelo or companies like Cervelo and Specialized kind of pushing that bar, customers expect more. They expect the, you know, the top companies to come out with new products and incrementally improve on the product lines. So I think Trek, you know, saw the competition kind of raising the bar, and they kind of had to do something to kind of stay relevant. So, alas, the, the new uh, Speed Concept was born. I'm not sure if you have a picture of it there. Do you, by chance? I do not, no. And, um, you know, they, they, they certainly have been floating around the pictures. I saw Lava Magazine had uh, theirs built up and, and ready to start test riding, which is pretty cool. I wonder if that was uh, Jay himself who is uh, going to be lucky enough to, um, to test ride that puppy. But, you know, I, I, the, the interesting part about it, and you and I had a little bit of a discussion about this, was the positioning in their marketing about the fact that they're using real-world conditions. You know, they, they mentioned that you can't base everything off of the wind tunnel anymore because you end up racing in real-world conditions. Now, to me, this seems kind of like a result of, of Specialized having their own wind tunnel and, and Trek not having one. They have to justify the fact that they don't have a wind tunnel and, and, and that they still have a fast bike or that they can still produce a fast bike. What, what do you think about that? Well, you know, I, I think that um, you know, Trek has actually... You know, obviously gone. You don't need to own your own wind tunnel. There's there's plenty of wind tunnels out there. Uh, in a recent test that that involved uh, the Cervelo uh, P53, the Trek Speed Concept, a, a Felt DA, um, and a few other bikes, the Trek Speed Concept actually came out on top when you included all yaw sweeps. And what Trek found was that they actually did some interesting things in which they placed uh, pressure meters around the bike um, and, and rode different courses like uh, the Kona World Championship uh, Ironman course. And uh, Ironman uh, Arizona was was able to find that most of these courses that we're racing on, the yaw angles are between seven and a half and twelve and a half degrees. So Trek designed this bike specifically to excel in these yaw conditions, and uh, that's how the new speed concept was kind of designed. And on top of that, they've done an amazing job uh, with the fit on this bike. So it's going to be able to fit better than before. It's going to be more stable than before. The brakes are going to work better. And what I think is kind of the coolest thing is that Trek does a great job in-house with Bontrager designing all kind of like add-on accessories, um, like my favorite, the butt cam, which uh, you can kind of see in this picture. They have actually have a bottle carrier and a, a storage container behind the, butt, the, set, the, the, the back of the rider, which almost creates a cam. Trek is big on the, the cam technology. And um, are you familiar with cam technology? Yeah, essentially it's when they cut off the, the tail because uh, the, the air is tricked into believing that the airfoil is still there even though that it's, it's not, essentially. I, th I think that's the, the gist of it. Yeah, essentially uh, back, uh, back in the, the 40s, uh, there's this German aerodynamicist, uh, you know, he was taking all these, these, these airfoil shapes and realized you could have a truncated airfoil, which means that if you have an airfoil that kind of looks like, uh, like this, this is obviously a crude drawing, but say this is a, a, uh, an airfoil, you can actually truncate it, cut off the back, the back part of the, of the wind tunnel or the, the airfoil like right here, and um, what, you, what you do is you take about 50% of the amplitude of the airfoil, cut it off when it reaches about 50% of the amplitude, and what he found is that this actually tricks the air to thinking that it's a complete airfoil shape. Um, it doesn't create the, it's about 95% is aerodynamic, but in bike frame design, it creates a stiffer frame, it creates a lighter frame, um, a better handling frame, and um, you know, for, for, for cycling, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a great shape. So um, it's, it's very interesting what, what Trek has done with Cam. I, I, I think some other cycling companies have kind of tried to you know, use truncated airfoils maybe before then, but Trek has really run with it. And now with their new butt cam, I've kind of turned with the butt cam, but it's really kind of a rear-mounted rear hydration uh, 
uh, that sits behind the saddle. It does the same thing with a rider. We have a, a rider who actually has this, this shape moving through the wind. It's trying to take that shape, narrow it down before it terminates, to try to reduce that negative pressure uh, behind the rider, which causes turbulence, which causes negative drag, which causes drag, and uh, ultimately slows you down. So, so Trek has all these accessories and bolt-on things to make your life easier on the bike. You don't have to think about it, and you know, use zip ties and have a kind of a rinky thing set up. They did a great job with this bike, and I. You, know, I, I, you and I are on, on completely different ends of the spectrum. You know, I, I love my bike to just be completely clean of, of anything. My setup um, is always, you know, one bottle in the frame, one bottle up front, uh, and that's about it. You know, my my tools and 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 uh, and and tires or spare tires in the in the rear, but just clean as, as you can get. I just don't like any clutter. Um, but you think that this is absolutely uh, something that that'll help in terms of, of making the rider more aerodynamic. So um, I guess if we're in the business of trying to get everything that makes us faster, uh, this is going to make sense for a lot of people. Yeah, I agree. So uh, I think it's going to be a, a cool bike. Um, I know uh, Jay Pursun uh, with Lava Magazine just received one over at their Lava offices in San Diego. I know they're going to be testing it soon. Not sure when it's going to be available, uh, but unlike Cervelo's release of the P5, uh, that kind of uh, they kind of released it about a year before anyone ever got one, and then you couldn't really get one. So that's kind of been kind of a rolling uh, available bike. Uh, I think Trek... You know, they don't mess around when it comes to this stuff. Neither does Specialized. When, it, when they unveil it, it's usually available right away. They want people buying them, getting on the road, and having people see them, and then they order them. So uh, these are pretty professional companies. They're pretty well run, and I, I expect these to be available probably um, around Kona in October. Yeah, I mean, these, these guys don't mess around when it comes to that. When And, and I've always given credit to Specialized and, and to Trek, as you said, because when they announce that something's going to be available on a certain date, it typically is, um, and they, they have very little uh, when it comes to delays and recalls. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Cannondale at this moment with their Slice RS and, and their brake recall. So uh, a lot of credit to Specialized and Trek, and, yeah, it, it, we probably should see it out on the market uh, fairly soon. Um, before we move on, though, I... I um, something that that um, that you failed to to mention about the cam uh, camtail design is it also um, I think a lot of it had to do with the three to one uh, UCI rule. It was a good way to get around the UCI three to one rule and still having a quote unquote deep um, airfoil shape, or at least in this case the camtail shape. Um, so. Yeah, so that was uh, that was another one of the of the, of the pluses for, for going to that shape. Yeah, you know, ultimately it saves money because they don't have to they don't have to have as many molds, they don't have to inventory as many bikes. Um, so shops don't need to worry about having a shiv specialized try and a shiv specialized UCI legal. They just have they have one uh, speed concept, and there's a couple things you can bolt on that aren't UCI legal, like the butt cam, and uh, like uh, you know the, the the triathlon air bars that have like a six to one. Uh, aerodynamic profile, so uh, they did a good job with it. They're a smart company, and I like kind of what they're putting out. And Cam is with a K. Um. <laughs> yeah, not 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 that butt Cam. Um, <laughs> different you've been, co different you've been co too many websites. <laughs> yeah, different. That that's a different uh, Google Hangout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, that's our midnight. <laughs> I'm going to stop while we're behind. <laughs> All right, well, well moving on, uh, just a couple of uh, gossip things I just want to touch upon real quick. Um, WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, uh, just recently, maybe you haven't heard, um, has, uh, has taken marijuana off of their uh, doping control uh, substance list. Uh, they're no longer going to be testing for it in competition. So uh, you know, if you look like, if you think Chris Vroom, looked a little, his eyes looked a little bit bloodshot, uh, you might know why. Uh, but kind of continuing that conversation, um, this week we had some unfortunate uh, doping positives with Tyson Gay and Asafa Powell, uh, both 100-meter sprinters, both at the top of their games, uh, testing positive for stimulants. And um, I, I thought this was interesting just because it all pertains to the doping conversation and the uh, substance kind of conversation. Addo Bolton, uh, the sprinter the comments uh, now for NBC, he said, you know what, just legalize the supplements and the stimulants that don't really do too much. 
because there's so many things on the list, you know, like marijuana was, that just don't do that much. Things that kind of trip you up, things that can easily be, you know, you know, in a supplement that you, you know, aren't going to really help. And you know, keep the steroids, keep the EPO, keep it banned. But there's, you know, there's hundreds of things that you know have marginal effect at best. And uh, if you think about even caffeine above 1,800 milligrams is banned. There's a lot of those kind of iffy things that you can kind of trip you up. And you know, Tyson Gay, you know, he's lost his Adidas sponsorship, Asafa Paul, he's lost his sponsorships, and these guys are finished. You know, that's it. It's game over. Um, they had, you know, a stimulant in their system. They shouldn't have been there. Uh, and you know, who knows how it got there? Maybe it was a cold medicine. Maybe it was just a tainted supplement. But um, you know, to have guys that are at the very top of their game, just go down, you know, below the ground in terms of their careers. You know, they're finished. And um, I'm not sure how you feel about that. But what, any any well, thoughts? I, yeah, I mean, when you're a professional athlete and your livelihood depends on that, you have to be absolutely certain that you what you're taking in your body complies with with any of the regulations any of the WADA protocols it, it just it, there can't be a mistake I don't care if if it's, if it's a tainted supplement or if somebody slipped you something in your drink it, it doesn't matter it's your responsibility to know what you can and what you cannot take I, you know I, I feel like a lot of these guys end up and girls end up hiding behind the fact that it was it was something tainted or a cold medicine or this or that and, and the other. It just it, it doesn't make any sense. They're playing a big game of, of Russian roulette and they're betting on the fact that they're just not going to get busted and when they do, I, I mean it's just unfortunate, but like you said, their career's over. You know, I, I, I have to disagree with you there because you can you can have such control over your life, but you know, if you think about the the, the race expo at Vine Man, we have all these vendors set up. And if you were to go down the list and just try ten supplements, you know, people hand you cups of different things, and uh, you know, who knows what's in those cups? And you know, if you go to different yeah, that's why you don't. That's why you don't try it. You know, but that's why I guess you have like Kenyan uh, Kenyan runners that you know, won't even take an Advil or Tylenol because they don't want to. You know, they don't know what's in the supplement. And they don't take the the pain reliever because you know they don't want to get busted for doping. Well, I, and you know, I I I, I agree with. Uh, I can't remember who you were saying was suggesting that they take away all of the things that don't really have, a, you know, a, a great effect on on performance, and just leave the ones that just absolutely do, uh, because it it would sometimes eliminate some some of these violations. But yeah, I, I you know I. You have to know, and and this is your life. I mean, the, regardless of what pres, uh, profession you work in, there, you have to deal with these sort of things. And as a professional athlete, you have to know what you're ingesting. You have to know what you can and what you cannot take. And you can't hide, even if it's a mistake. You can't you can't do it. Well, here's uh, one thing that was interesting, and, and then we can jump off this issue. But um, I think I mentioned to you briefly. Uh, I had a friend that was in town, uh, into California, for a natural bodybuilding competition that was held uh, on Saturday, and um, she was actually it's a it's a natural body. You know, bodybuilders. You know, tend we have the stigma that you know most bodybuilders are taking steroids, and you know, in the unlimited classes, you know, a lot of them are. Uh, but they have natural body comp natural bodybuilding competitions in which you know these kinds of supplements and uh, you know steroids aren't allowed, and they actually test for them. So, you know, not only do they give you a urine test, they give you a blood test, and then third, most surprisingly to me, was they actually give you a polygraph test. They give you a, an abbreviated lie detector test uh, before the competition to ask you about doping and whether or not you've doped, and uh, that kind of blew my mind. I'd never heard of anything like that before. And uh, so, what do you think? Should we should we be having polygraphs before uh, you know you line up for races? That'd be pretty interesting, actually. I you know that those are those are not easy to um, well those are not a hundred percent reliable. I think uh, in in courts you can't a polygraph test can't be admitted as evidence or something like that just because they're not always a hundred percent accurate. And there are ways of of passing those tests. Um, so. I think it's a cool concept. I think it's an interesting concept. I think it probably discourages some people from doping, or at least it makes them think twice about it. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, I think if people can get away with taking HGH and this and that and the other, they're going to get away with with passing a polygraph test. Yeah, people will be doping to pass the polygraph test, taking a, a beta blocker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the the good old uh, putting a putting a thumbtack in your foot and you know s stepping on it every time just to uh, to elevate your 
your heart rate on those control questions. I think they just need to bring out uh, Robert De Niro, you know, like in Ben Stiller, like uh, from Meet the Parents, and uh, you know, never mind. All right, let's move on. All right, the last uh, segment of the evening is um, every week we like to give a little bit of a uh, tip for you all viewers out there that are interested in triathlon. Uh, we have a lot of experience uh, racing and training, so uh, my tip for you this week is um, Andres and I are both building up to our peak race of the year. Um, I know I'm training a lot. I know Andres is pretty lazy, so he's probably not training. He's just trying to lose weight. So uh, no, I'm just joking. I know you're training hard, Andres. But um, you know, you, when you're doing two, three, four workouts a day, uh, I just want to remind our viewers that you got to make sure you're getting your rest. And I, I don't mean rest from workouts, but rest, sleeping, naps, if possible. Um, you really, really got to focus during these weeks. Uh, the training is just as important as the rest. Just as important as the nutrition. Um, this is the time to really buckle down and be disciplined. Try to get the eight hours of sleep. Um, I saw an interesting um, comment uh, from Thomas Gerlach, a professional triathlete that kind of splits his time between Tucson and Madison, Wisconsin. Um, he has a rule in which he sleeps eight hours a night and then adds an extra hour. I think I believe it's an extra hour of sleep for every hour of exercise. Uh, maybe it's a half hour extra sleep for every hour of exercise. So you know, if he went for it, he has this rule that if he exercises more, he gets more sleep. I think that's a great idea. Um, a lot, I know of a lot of Olympians that sleep 10, 12 hours a day. Um, I personally, I don't think I can lay in bed. I think I get uh, you know bed sores. I think if I if I slept that much. Um, but just really, really remind our viewers this to get at least eight hours of sleep a night. Um, if you can be you know undisturbed. And uh, if you can even get a 15 to 30 minute nap a day is even better. So it's really good for uh, testosterone production, for HGH production. Uh, these are the legal hormones that are produced by your body that help you recover and are absolutely necessary for, for meeting your optimum performance. So if you're getting less than eight hours of sleep, you might think that you can operate and you might actually be able to live off eight, less than eight hours. You can, might, you can live off four hours a night, but you will not be getting the full hormone secretion from your body, from your brain, if, unless you get a full eight hours of sleep. It's a fact, and you've heard of it on This Week in Triathlon. So that's the tip for this week. Well, and I, should, I should in particular, uh, in particular um, be one to listen to, uh, to that tip. I rarely get eight hours of sleep uh, a day, and, uh, but I should. I should. I, I, think, it's, uh, I think you've had um, a lot of great points of, of, of why it's a it's a good thing to uh, to do that, and uh, you know I, I think too for a lot of people, um, <laughs> you know it, we 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 joked about our, our our weight loss contest, but but you tend to gain weight when you don't get uh, as much sleep as well. Um, just your body gets all sorts of out of whack, so uh, it's it's great for a number of different reasons, and um, you know I, I should be one to uh, to take that advice. Um, we'll see. Yeah, and uh, just going back to weight loss, I, I, I tend to do all my snacking kind of between uh, 10 at night and 11 at night. So uh, if I go to bed at 8.30, 9 o'clock, I can eliminate those 1,000 extra crap calories I take in eating chips and eating candy and ice cream and God knows what else. And uh, you know, put the computer down, put the phone down, and just go to bed. Yeah, and um, you know, remember, when it gets to that time and uh, – and you're craving some food, uh, eat a piece of raw garlic, which I tried for the first time the other day, and uh, Susan told me not to get anywhere near her. So what do you think? Uh, so just to let our viewers know, uh, I told you if you ever have hunger pains, if you're trying to lose weight, maybe late at night, and uh, you want to pick on some junk food, eat some raw garlic, because it kind of, it, it really takes the hunger away. Did you feel that effect at all or no? Not at all. I actually felt a little bit more hungry. Um, but, you know, I... I <laughs> I actually, I didn't think the garlic was, was bad at all in terms of, I, I expected it to be a lot worse, a lot more painful to eat, but it, it was uh, a little spicy, which I tend to like spicy foods. Um, you know, I, I can't uh, comment, actually I can because she told me to get away from her. Um, you know, it, it must not be pleasant to be around somebody who eats a, a full thing of garlic, but, um, but it wasn't as bad as, as I expected it to be. All right, well, at least for our viewers, uh, we can let them know that it works uh, 100% of the time, 50% of the time. <laughs> yeah, as uh, Mr. Ron Burgundy would say. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, with that, uh, I'm going to hit the hay and go to sleep, get my, uh, my hormones going, and uh, thanks for uh, another great show, Andres. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thank you, and I guess we'll see everybody next Thursday, huh? Yes, sir. See you then.